Uh, good. Excellent. All right, so we are recording. Um, and I do just want to say um, absolutely thank you very much and, and welcome to the panel. Uh, incredible conversation today. Uh, just waiting for us around um, the Indigenous entrepreneur ecosystem within Australia. What exactly does that mean and, and, and what's happened over time uh, with a very specific focus on capital raising. Um, and this conversation was prompted by a conversation that, that Les and I had uh, a little while ago. Uh, around his uh, around the new program for the Mindaroo Foundation, um, supporting the training specifically in bringing up uh, Indigenous investors. Uh, and as I scan the world, uh, I think that is fairly innovative and unique. Um, and there's a lot of things for supporting Indigenous entrepreneurs, um, but this is very much building capacity and capability in the Indigenous investor cohort. Um, I, I do want to uh, acknowledge the traditional owners on the land on which which we all do present from um, here up in, in Niagara country um, and do pay respect to elders, both past, present and emerging. Uh, and uh, I also want to acknowledge that this conversation is happening in the midst of significant effort within support for indigenous. Um, and any one of us uh, I'm sure can um, comment on uh, like people that we know that are operating in this space from, from Dean Foley down in Victoria, doing a lot of work around Barramoral um, and creating a lot of different programs down there. Um, uh, Tanya Egerton up in Circular Nation doing some exceptional work supporting Indigenous uh, up in Northern Territories. Um, uh, mm -hmm. You also have EJ Garrett, who's really doing a lot of work with buying black and, and, and sharing those stories. Kieran Shirley, who did some really good mapping work um, back last November. Um, and I just recently had a conversation with Bettina Tiemann uh, with II Hub up in Cairns and really going out there to, to build that pipeline. So I just share all of those as, as examples of which there's uh, dozens and dozens more saying that this isn't the, the entirety of the conversation, um, but it's, it's also building on a lot of the work that's already happening. And it's part of this tapestry of, of narratives that are going on. And the third acknowledgement I'd like to, to share is that this, is, this conversation is happening um, within, a, uh, within the expansion of the Australian innovation ecosystem. What was back 2015, 2016, a bit of all things to all people and, and supporting entrepreneurs that, that may have you know kind of been already had access. We are now seeing a, a significant expansion into things such as supporting indigenous, supporting female entrepreneurs, remote and regional entrepreneurship. Um, those that may not have had access um, to the ecosystem as we know it back say five, 10 years ago. So it's all part of this continuum of which this conversation is just one point in time. Um, so with all that said, what I'd love to do is I'm going to turn it over and just allow the, the panelists to introduce themselves. We really have a, a fantastic lineup today. Um, uh, just a bit of housekeeping it before I get into that. Um, for those attending, uh, if you have any questions or comments, please put them in the chat. Q&A also should be open. We'll be able to get to those during a discussion time towards the end. Um, we'd love to hear about your programs and what you're doing as well. Um, so... With that in mind, I'm going to turn it over and I'm going to start going through the, the panelists. We'd love to hear, you know, maybe introduce yourselves, who you are, what you do, uh, and maybe your take on um, the entrepreneurial ecosystem, the innovation ecosystem within Australia, um, with a specific focus on how you see it applying to supporting Indigenous entrepreneurship uh, in Australia. Um, and Les, I'm going to start off with you because you and I kind of had that initial session conversation that kicked it off, and then we'll just go around the virtual room. Awesome. Thanks, Chad, uh, and thanks for organising this as well. It's a really exciting opportunity to be here with uh, with everyone on this panel. It's a pretty full, it's a full stack panel. But uh, first, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I stand, the Wajakungar people, uh, on the Nungar Nation on Nungar Puja here in Perth for this virtual meeting and paying my respects to their elders and emerging leaders on this country, um, and especially more broadly, uh, everyone on this call as well. But I'm. Um, as Chad said, Les Delaforce, which I learned, I'm a Dangari man from the mid north coast of New South Wales originally, and uh, born in Kempsey, family through Coffs Harbour and then Bucket Heads, mm. uh, Port Macquarie, moved across to Perth uh, probably 12 years ago. So, got into startups around, got well, that startup bug after actually reading a four hour work week uh, quite many years ago now. But my take on the Indigenous entrepreneurship ecosystem, particularly around Indigenous startups, it's a um, starting out. Uh, you know, raising, trying to raise capital was really quite challenging in the 2016, 17 days. Um, and finally, there was uh, a lot of, so it was some ch challenges and barriers. There were some really key people that were supporters uh, of Indigenous entrepreneurship and Indigenous, indigenous startups. And I, and I guess I'd like to shout out 
Rick Baker from Blackbird Ventures, who was just it was just absolutely incredible in that 2016 period for growing up in Kempsey uh, and sitting in those meeting rooms with some pretty big name VCs. But it's it's a pretty exciting uh, and dynamic, growing and but also evolving ecosystem. I think it's been driven by a combination of uh, some government policy, whether it's the IPP more broadly to create successful indigenous businesses and the flow and effect into indigenous startups, uh, corporate engagement, but also it's been really le really led by that grassroots level by indigenous entrepreneurs across the country. And there's, I feel as though there's a, it's a powerful combination that's resulted in this exponential growth that we're starting to see right now. Uh, the foundations were certainly being built in that 2016-17 period of the likes of you know, uh, Michaela Jade, Liam, Gavin uh, in that space and effectively helping to start to create this ecosystem. And right now you're seeing, as Chad said, you mentioned a few others in there, there's so many amazing digital entrepreneurs that are operating in different uh, environments across the, in different countries and uh, across Australia. It's, it is a dynamic time. I think we are talking to Liam earlier, we are on this journey together and it's all about collaboration, what we can learn from others and and, and obviously in return learn from us as well. Uh, but it's it's a really dynamic, exciting time. So I'll leave it at that for, for me. Um, yeah. Excellent. Thanks, Les. Um, and, and it's interesting hearing you reiterate, even just as, as far back as 2016, you're saying there's a bit of a gap, a bit of a bit of a deficit there. Um, but then some of those instrumental grassroots type movement where we're now seeing that. You know, what you refer to as that bit of that exponential growth. Um, Gavin, uh, you know, just reading briefly on your on your bio, as far as um, just kind of the, your history and your experience in all of this and some of the projects that you're working on, I'd love to hear kind of what you're involved in and also what your take is on it. Yeah, perfect. Thanks so much for having me and uh, equally uh, pay my respects and acknowledge country uh, here in uh, uh, Eora Nation, the Gadigal people of the Eora in busy downtown Pitt Street. Um, but uh, yeah, certainly um, bring two perspectives, I guess, um, one of, um, and, and of both perspectives, um, uh, I, I guess, um, relate to enterprise. Um, and I should, I guess, furthermore with, uh, uh, I guess, Les and yourself, Dan, thanks, thanks for the invitation. Um, so uh, Kunya, Kunya and Marawari are from Kadugaway, Mason's um, Northwest New South Wales, mum's side of family, um, proud, uh, uh, I guess in a city or city, uh, Blackfellow as such down this way. Um, I guess my journey um, in enterprise as a touch on um, come about through a meeting up with a founding director, Ian Jackson there back in uh, UTS Business School. And uh, at that time, yeah, we were running a, a quite an innovative um, undergrad business degree that actually took Aboriginal professionals through the process of uh, startup, yeah, as well. So. Um, that was where I first met um, Ian, and uh, in particular, um, this is where we both um, verged on uh, this thinking around a not-for-profit venture capitalist model approach, which later become worthwhile ventures, of which we're um, uh, still growing and, and learning lots about at this point in time. But certainly, yeah, it's taking the disciplines of venture capitalism and, and applying them in a charitable manner. So um, my, my, my connections in this space are just name myself as a bit of an enabler. I'm just here as a, my point in time, I'm here to help enable um, those passions and aspirations of our community and mob um, because for, for too, far too long, um, they've been um, disengaged. And uh, I think um, answering your question about the ecosystem for me uh, refers to uh, the opportunity that is before us. And, and we are soon to ignite, I think, uh, more indigenous ways of doing in this space. Um, and it's fair to call out that Australia, and no doubt more globally, we've, uh, we don't design uh, for the minority and invite the majority to find their, their own way to fit in. You know, this is an all too common storyline and, and status. Um, uh, that is, you know, why, um, you know, we're working from a Western majority design model uh, and doing, um, and thankfully, um, yeah, we do have allies, emerge, emerging allies like yourselves here today and our listeners as well, that um, you know, when things settle and a few external triggers um, perhaps disrupt and challenge the majority Western state, uh, they, they observe, you know, um, and, and it's great to see that, um, that they're truly listening to, to the Aboriginal voice. And, and we're certainly watching from afar, you know, that um, they do uh, look to uh, 
understand that you know our voices are there and and certainly our allies are seeing that our people and communities on the that are are, are on the fringes of the ecosystem and, and we're certainly um uh seeing further disempowerment you know in terms of engaging and coming together in the current ecosystem so it's so it's really great that this this conversation is happening um and i just want to be part of that enablement piece um and worthwhile ventures i think is quite a a unique intermediary uh, in the landscape at this stage, um, helping Aboriginal businesses in in areas of success that they self-determine, you know? So yeah, pleased to be here. Excellent, thanks, thanks Gavin. It's great to have you here. Uh, and one of, the, one of the things I wanna pick up from that from that story you shared, uh, and thank you very much for that, is this, this natural, there, there's a natural growth where you have um, participants in what we know as the ecosystem, much like you participated in UTS, and you meet a few people and you start expanding out and then you say, well, what, what does this mean for indigenous? And then you as a particular leader then say, well, let's create a fund specifically this and you start addressing that out of a cohort of so many that went through that. Now, that's a natural growth. The, the question that we have though is, is there a way to rubber band that? Is there a way to exponentially not just wait for that natural evolution to happen, but how do we expedite it and get to what, what that's what's saying as far as that exponential growth. Um, Liam, I'm gonna hand over to you. Um, again, just who you are and what you do and reflections, not just on where we're at with the ecosystem, but also, um, I guess, Les's and, and Gavin's stories as far as, um, you know, that, that growth, growth pattern. Absolutely. Thanks, Chad. I mean, thank you for having me. So um, my name's Liam Ridgeway. Um, so I reside here on um, Gadigal country. So I'd also like to um, pay my respects to um, elders past and present and um, uh, pay my respects as well to the communities here and their connection to land, sea and water. Um, I'd also like to pay my respects as well to um, uh, my Aboriginal brothers and sisters um, on this um, call today or whoever will listen to this recording um, now or in the near future. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm a Gumbangata man, so similar to, to Les, so my family on my dad's line is um, uh, Gumbangata from around the Nambaka Heads um, region. Um, also have a connection through, again, my dad's lineage to Dungari Waramai and Yuan Nations. And then on my mum's line, um, I'm connected to the, the Waka Waka people um, of uh, Sherberg and around that area. Um, I'm so the co-founder of Nakanyagu, um, NGNY for short. So it's a 100% Aboriginal owned digital agency. And I'm also the co-founder of uh, Indigitech, uh, which is a charity which provides um, and supports learning and career pathways for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people um, through STEM, um, particularly with a focus around um, technology. Um, and similar to Gavin, I'm also um, uh, on the board for Worthwhile Ventures um, as well. So uh, looking at supporting Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander or particularly Aboriginal businesses in New South Wales at the moment, um, but also supporting Torres Strait Islander people as well with um, uh, Indigenous business um, support and um, guidance and advice. Um, so my, I guess my story is, so um, I, in the early 2000s, started working at Microsoft um, that's where I started my, my career in the tech space. Um, when I was working at Microsoft, uh, a non-Indigenous gentleman um, and I were on a flight to the US for a conference and uh, we started talking about an idea. Uh, that idea turned into, um, a little while later, a business in itself. Uh, it was a tech startup that we had. Um, we took that to multiple rounds of investment. Um, we had some um, supporters. We went through um, the process over a few years. Uh, but then I had a, a moment where I realised that I wasn't doing as much connection and engagement with community and I was getting a lot of requests for support and in the in the digital and tech space. And so what happened as a result was um, uh, I started doing some side projects and side work on um, uh, with Indigenous organisations. As a result, set up NGNY, my, my co-founder, um, who's also um, Indigenous as well. Um, and then through that journey set up um, in Digitech, um, realizing that there wasn't as much presence as we thought that there could be um, within this, with particularly the tech within the tech space than, uh, than STEM overall. So my experience um, being, uh, I guess, an entrepreneur um, in this space, especially with my first business um, and taking it to multiple rounds of investment, we didn't necessarily go out and we didn't talk about being identified as an indigenous business. Um, I did talk about myself being uh, an Indigenous person within that business, but um, we were building a particular type of technology that we were aiming to take to market. And at the time, um, that was around 2011. Um, at the time, there was quite a bit of an appetite for um, investors exploring um, 
uh, investing their money into um, various tech businesses. So there was lots of hustle, there was lots of grind. There was um, going in and talking to um, uh, angel investors and seed funders and uh, et cetera, and getting some more often than not getting, you know, pushed out the door because, you know, what we were presenting, what we're doing wasn't necessarily right for them. But for me, that was a learning opportunity. And I think seeing what is going on through the Indigenous business sector at the moment, there's absolutely a great amount of opportunity. And because there is such um, a, a great narrative and a great amount of support um, going through um, this space, it just it allows us to go on this, this journey where we're learning all together as Indigenous and non-Indigenous people to look at how we actually start to invest and collaborate more in this ecosystem. So when we talk about investment, it's not just about investing money, it's about investing time and ideas and support. And, you know, as Les mentioned previously, about that collaboration and sharing those ideas so that we can all grow and move together so that we can create a sustainable ecosystem uh, that is shared with both Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. Yeah, th thanks for that, Liam. Um, and yeah, it, it's a it's a really good story um, in terms of kind of seeing a need. And so you create a business actually to solve that need. Like, you know, quite often we, we talk about startups doing that thing and now you're doing that same thing to support those startups. Um, but the other thing I pick up from that is um, you know, where you mentioned, we don't necessarily see ourselves as indigenous business, but I'm indigenous in the business. Um, but quite often we do see a bit of this, almost like a, a two stream, a parallel conversation within you've got the innovation ecosystem and even how we frame this conversation to the indigenous innovation ecosystem. I mean, especially when you go to regions, like the hubs alone are, are trying to do everything they can just to support all entrepreneurs and then these separate programs off, off to the side. And part of the, the power of having this panel and Lauren, want to kind of hop over to you because obviously Startmate, uh, incredibly respected within the startup community um, with significant outcomes and impacts. Um, but what we want to do is we say, well, what, how does that conversation happen with getting everyone around the table and having a real pragmatic, practical discussion on saying, so how do we support indigenous entrepreneurship in Australia while we're also supporting fast growth, high tech, and, and they're not two separate things. So I'd love to hear your take a little bit more about who you are, what you do. Startman's an incredible program. I want to hear more about that, as well as your reflections on some of the conversations and um, the Indigenous support in Australia. Thank you, Chad. And yeah, I, I feel quite honoured to be part of this, this conversation and, and do see myself as much as a listener um, to the perspectives of, of Les and Liam and Gavin as well, because there's so much to learn from, from those perspectives. Um, I want to acknowledge the, the traditional owners of the land that I'm joining everyone from today, the Gubby Gubby people up in the Sunshine Coast. Uh, and yeah, just, just want to, again, pay my respects to elders past and present as well. I think we are at such a critical time in terms of bringing multiple streams of conversation together and actually I guess uniting under this perspective of what does it look like to have the most healthy and um, ambitious startup ecosystem across the whole country and even the whole region if we want to think about it like that. In terms of my work at Startmate my role there is principal which is primarily focused on finding what we term as the most ambitious founders across Australia and New Zealand. And I guess that that concept of ambition um, is is hard to define, but there is this quality of you know uh, entrepreneurs who are seeing the the opportunity to uh, you know grow something exponentially. Usually, there's technology involved, and usually there's a large or outsized impact that can come from from the development of those businesses. But but when you get past that level of ambition, it looks like many different sectors, many different kind of um, business models from, you know, consumer to enterprise, um, hardware, software, direct to consumer. So it really does encompass everything. It's the layer of ambition that is the thing that we're, we're really seeking. Uh, and so I joined Startmate in August last year and am very much responsible for or driving the thinking around what, what we're framing as um, our equitable design work. Uh, very much taking cues from Aubrey Blanche, who is now at Culture Amp and was previously at Atlassian. My perspective is that um, given we have honestly had a lack of representation and involvement from First Nations entrepreneurs and, and community leaders over the 10-year the history of Startmate, there's more that we need to do to design our programs and our communities and our outreach um, to, to be equitable and accessible to those who identify as ambitious entrepreneurs and that can look like anything um, so yeah that that's I guess how how I see um, the challenge ahead that we have to make sure that we are building links and relationships and knowing where and how we can support um, in 
in providing what what I see as Startmates assets, this incredible community of mentors and investors who, who really are the best across Australia and New Zealand um, and making sure that they are um, accessible to ambitious entrepreneurs who are coming from First Nations backgrounds, but also the big challenge that I want to address, uh, and you know, I've, I've, um, Les and I have talked a lot about this, is that we are also representing um, the the incredible Indigenous entrepreneurs, uh, investors, and and uh, mentors in our communities as well. I think the the bifurcation of these things has gone on for too long, and there should be, you know, uh, somebody like Les participated in our office hours program last year and spoke to many different entrepreneurs of whom he was able to offer great value, um, as well as supporting some of the, the First, Nation, First Nations entrepreneurs who came through the program. So how do we kind of have much more of a holistic um, approach to, to kind of building this ambition in our ecosystem as well? Thanks for that, Lauren. And, and I do love that distinction. And it really inspired me when we were having a chat just even before this started, as far as really understanding um, what your place is. You know, and it is that that hyper ambitious entrepreneurs, which which can feel a bit exclusive, but you kind of like say, well, everybody in the ecosystem has a role to play in certain areas. And so this is what we're after. And so how, but then you asked the, the really good question. So, so how do we engage and access and get more indigenous as a representation in that? And sometimes that is representation within our mentors, representation within our investors. Um, so people can you know, see what that looks like. Um, and so I wanna shift the conversation. And as I do, uh, if you are in, in attendance, please feel free to say hello on the chat, say where you're from, um, happy to have a bit of a conversation and dialogue, inject some of those into the conversation, um, uh, as well as we have a Q and A function. So feel free to hop in there and, and put any questions that you want in there if you are watching live right now. Um, so I want to shift to what's next. We had a bit of a, a bit of a conversation around, so what does it currently look like from your personal perspectives? But if we were to say, where do we see it moving forward? Um, and Les, when, when you have a yarn, I definitely want to hear specifically about your program and, and why that came to be and, and why you see that as a, as a need right now. But from other perspectives, how do we address this, this gap that we currently have around support for entrepreneurs and and, and potentially what um, what is already having access and, and potentially easier to, to engage with some of the existing ecosystem and where we have potentially a lack of re representation. What do you see that's exciting over the next two to three years that would come into play? And maybe other people who watch this after the fact, what can they get involved in? Um, so I might just throw it out there open first in best dress without necessarily calling on people, but just let that sit for a bit and say, okay, what is next? What is exciting? If we could do anything, what do you see kind of on the move? I can jump in quickly, Chad, if that um, helps to kick off the conversation. I guess even sort of just going back to what Lauren was talking about, and that's, um, I think she's made a really good point around that, particularly around that collaboration piece and Liam, what we've been talking about. Um, it's, it's a really fragmented ecosystem at the moment, but with a lot of amazing work happening across the country. So there's this you know, thought that you know, VCs aren't doing enough or whatnot, but some VCs we've been talking to don't know where these Indigenous startups are. So it's about us then helping direct that and collaborating. And that's certainly been a, a great journey uh, with particularly with Startmate, uh, with jumping on office hours and Lauren invited me, meeting a few of those young Indigenous startups and then they've come through, we've taken them and, uh, on a journey internally here at uh, Generation One, Miguru Foundation. And then we've shifted into uh, then introducing them to other networks. And one of those startups, it's not public yet, I was hoping it would be for this call, it's not public yet, but one of these uh, Indigenous startups that went through um, Startmate that Lauren introduced us to, that we help provide some support internally um, and then introduced to some other VC networks they've just received investment so it's it shows that the, this collaboration piece between indigenous and non-indigenous organizations and actual entrepreneurs and non-indigenous entrepreneurs is really critical and really important and there's a success right there whereas this indigenous startup is looking at going back to their corporate job so now they're just about to hire another nine people with a focus on the employing Aboriginal people and that's that's really exciting it's things that you know, we've been trying to work on for years and years. And I think it goes back to much like Liam, uh, when it was just, you know, a couple of us trying to, you know, get into these boardrooms and pitch uh, to VCs and not necessarily understanding and making lots of mistakes. Like when we had our startup, we were two weeks away from, or we, I 
through my government job. I went through a program called the Murray Masterclass at Melbourne Business School. Absolutely incredible program. Uh, decided to resign from my security blanket, which is a government job, and then went down that uh, the entrepreneurial uh, roller coaster ride of no income for 12 months, a wife was six months pregnant. And that was a lesson in diplomacy, you're quitting anyway. And uh, then how to navigate through those choppy waters. And certainly a lot of stress. We failed the first time raising um, investment through angels from Perth, Brisbane and Melbourne. But ultimately, we, like Liam was saying, we learned a hell of a lot and we applied those learnings to then a successful uh, capital raise through, through venture capital out of Sydney. And that helped us scale. But then once we have exited Covacate, our startup, um, 2019 was then some of those challenges that we faced trying to raise capital then looking around you know what other more apart from like Liam and Kayla has done this before who can I talk to and, and how can I get some advice and well how do we then flip it and then create some opportunities for to support more Aboriginal people not just me or not just ourselves um, but how do we support more broadly more Aboriginal entrepreneurs to get to that stage like we are the Indigenous procurement policy, uh, Indigenous businesses uses uh, use debt funding quite a lot in comparison to equity investment. But it's a, as I said before, it's a rapidly growing ecosystem. But what we're seeing now with a range of programs, like whether it's the Dream Summit, um, that Dream that um, Liam Rich was involved with, uh, Blackbird was also involved as well back in 2019, uh, to now the, the masterclass is like the role of Gen 1, having now the capital behind this, not just an idea of me just trying to, how do we create, trying to do this myself, but having the capital behind us then to connect other pieces, build programs, and then do this at scale. So rather than one person, how do we then build a program like this during Venture Masterclass to support prospective Indigenous angel investors, help Indigenous entrepreneurs to, to become investor ready and effectively you know, create the connections um, or equipping Indigenous Australians with connections, capabilities, and effectively access to capital to become investor ready or ready to invest. And we know we can't do this ourselves. so. Who are those partners out there? And we're still learning. They're like, how do we grow this at scale? So shifting from the individual, what can I get out of it, or individuals get it out, they get out of it, or startups get out of it, but more broadly, how does the community participate? So it comes back to the collaboration, and then how does that facilitate back in and to provide resources and results back to community as well? And thanks for that, Les. Um, and that collaboration, I mean, Liam, you brought up before as well, um, absolutely key. Uh, we are starting to get some people coming through here as well as far as saying hello uh, and a few shout outs um, you know we got essentially the ecosystem popping in um, we got amy from ey uh, jerry from first innovators thank you uh, renee from core innovation hub um, and uh, we've got um, a question here as well which will continue the theme i want to hear from others as far as what they see next um, for supporting additional entrepreneurs but maybe with a with a lens on uh, what one person asked, if we assume VC wants to invest in the best business they can to get the best ROI, how does it being funded by First Nations people impact that? What is different? Is it different? Um, and it's it's a good question to say, well, what is the distinction? But then we also put this lens on there on is the innovation ecosystem only for some? Um, and one of the statements I often say is innovation is morally neutral. It'll just point and then create wealth where it's most easiest to access. And that's we're intentional about how do we create wealth for more? So I might just throw that question in there for whoever wants to, to raise their hand and have a bit of a yarn around um, what they see is coming up next. Um, I'll, I'll jump in. I would actually love to hear from Gavin on this, but I'll, I'll jump in with a perspective from Startmate start mate side of things um the reality is that not all businesses in general are right for venture capital and there's almost become this this idea that to be successful you must be able to raise venture capital so i think the first thing to unpack generally speaking is is a business right for venture capital if a business is right for venture capital and happens to be founded by a, a first nations person i mean that is that is a great thing and but it's not necessarily the best thing it just happens to be what what will position that business uh, in the best way for for that kind of more exponential growth or scale whatever is being sought there my biggest um question or the thing that i think a lot about from the perspective of the venture capital side of things is you know there are so many problems with the way the venture capital ecosystem globally has evolved and grown and and i think you were kind of getting to that chad there is 
you know, there's a lot of centralized power, control, privilege, wealth, all these kinds of things that go hand in hand with, with venture capital. And it's it looks a lot better in Australia than it does in perhaps other markets, but from a kind of um, having stakeholders uh, at the table who come from First Nations backgrounds at the table of venture capital or investing right now is still, I would think, extremely rare, as is it rare to have even, you know, women at the table from a gender perspective and a whole bunch of other kind of diversity challenges that exist there. When I think about Startmate, the biggest challenge I have is, you know, I would love to support First Nations entrepreneurs coming through, but I feel less comfortable doing so knowing that none of the money uh, that we're investing and none of the the equity or the carry that that is being um, kind of shared is actually going to, to First Nations investors as well and and that kind of uh, challenge to unpack. So uh, yeah, Gavin, I would love your perspective on the on the funding side of things. And I know Les is doing a lot of work on um, the, the Indigenous investor side of things as well. Um, as I reflect on the question, um, Chad, um, I hope to think that that in investment and expected return on that investment is um, that there's shared values, I guess, around for purpose, um, for purpose. Um, um, I, I dare say there would be quite a difference of um, some areas of difference in, in being a non-Indigenous investor to an Indigenous um, venture and, and or, yeah, to, to where it's an Indigenous investor to indigenous venture now I say that that there's difference because it's relationship yeah come we come from a place of relationship first and foremost and we're certainly not always but uh, uh, predominantly coming from from a for purpose um, thinking and and impact for whatever that venture entails I dare say it would in most instances have a, a reciprocity to to community to recognising um, that historical capital that the Aboriginal entrepreneur has come from, you know, it's paying back. Um, so this fit, uh, this area that, that um, uh, you touch on, Lauren, around differences of um, capital, differences of um, interests and, and uh, uh, what, what does a return on in investment look like uh, is so different, you know, and I think this area of... Um, Recognising that um, that diverse landscape in in the ecosystem in this area between uh, uh, an entrepreneur uh, or, or or our investor space, um, and picking up on on Les, um, I think we do need to work at how we form more communities. Yeah, in a context, particularly we're talking Aboriginal First Nations. You know, we talk communities, we talk relationships. Uh, and we want to want to um, be safe in networks in such communities. Um, so we, we do need, I think, to look at identifying uh, further to um, our indigenous ecosystem and its community and map that. And Chad, he's he's in the broader landscape there, and it's great seeing what you're endeavouring to do, Chad, more broadly. But hey, let's let's bring an Aboriginal lens to that, and and particularly find a way how we could um, find identity, find a greater um, um, disclosure of identity, the disclosure of our values, of, of what our interests are, and um, perhaps some intermediaries who can, uh, without any agenda, uh, find uh, connections and, and bring that collaboration Les talking about, you know, to do it in a neutral way and an enabling way, um, because it's, we're so spread afar uh, and, and we really don't see uh, or, or see where the front doors are. Uh, so literally, we need to help enable some of that uh, connection to occur. Yeah, can I just, think? Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Liam. Yeah, so I just wanted to, I guess, kind of um, add in, uh, on a few other points that have been made and kind of extend on that. And, um, you know, we talked about this idea of, of collaboration. And when I look at when I talk about collaboration, I'm talking about the learning journey that we both go on together as uh, Indigenous entrepreneurs, Indigenous investors and uh, uh, non-Indigenous investors as well and what the whole ecosystem looks like and how it works together. Um, but that learning journey is about learning around, about the, the and respecting the nuances on, on both sides of what, what is the particular journey um, that we're going on, but what is the history as well in terms of what does the, the past ecosystem environment look like? And when I talk about that, I'm talking about, um, you know, Lauren talked about this, you know, this point with the key word around, um, you know, I guess like privilege and things like that. And um, 
unfortunately in our community, we haven't been uh, afforded with the, the same amount of privileges. So there's a, still a lot of catching up to go when we look at it from a, a Western context, but then there's a lot of catching up when we look at it from an Indigenous context that uh, non-Indigenous Australia and non, the non-Indigenous world need to kind of look at from the perspective of learning from our experiences and our, our ecosystem and how we can create new opportunities and sustainability um, you know, through that pathway. And that's one of the points that government is making around um, values. Um, what is what is value on, on on both sides of the fence, and is is the value that that a um, an investor sets the, the perception of what actual value is, or do we do we actually get to collaborate and talk about and learn from each other around um, you know the differences and similarities and the coexistence of, of values as well? Um, you know, and for me, it's like looking at and saying, how do we actually put weighting on indigenous perspectives in the way that you would actually look at the value of a particular investment, um, as opposed to looking at it from just a a Western lens, and I think that it's important for um, the conversation to happen. And when I think about, you know, the what next, I think about um, Chad. This like this this whole idea around the fact that we're just having this conversation right now, having this panel, and the fact that this is actually the the starting point for us to continue a dialogue and an opportunity to grow and work together. Because if these conversations don't happen at a baseline, then we then don't get to grow and accelerate from. Um, the point where we're at at the moment. So I think it's about looking at and understanding the foundations of where we're at, how we then start to learn and build and grow from um, from, from those foundations. Uh, thanks for that, Liam. Um, and, and Gavin and even and Lauren, like that, that comment you made, like I just had, a, had an awareness. Like I, I didn't even think about where that money's actually going from uh, investment side of things. We all talk about, wait, how, how do we get more uh, Indigenous businesses or Indigenous entrepreneurs invested in? But then who benefits from that and where does that money go? Which I guess speaks to less, that's kind of the reason why you're trying to get the, the Indigenous investors there. So that money actually goes back to the Indigenous community as well. So they're, they're deriving some of the wealth from this activity we're doing. Um, and I'll, I'll bring up a, a couple of points on that one. I just made a couple of notes here. Um, you know, one of them is just facilitating that question and, and then saying, so what do we want to do about that question? Do we ignore it or do we actually start creating programs and start going towards that? but also this movement towards a values-based conversation. Um, and one, one of the narratives that I, I, I'm experimenting with is this evolution we've seen in movements. We had the quality movement back in the 70s and, and Toyota principles and TQM, which then evolved into sustainability and Al Gore and, and um, you know, an inconvenient truth. And then GFC hit and that parked for a while. But the, all these things started getting embedded into how we do business and then innovation and innovation hubs and, and pitch events and hackathons. But it now feels like that's almost being integrated into just the day-to-day -day effort. My hope and the question, and maybe one of the reasons, Liam, why we're having this conversation now is perhaps that social consciousness, that social awareness on what is it that we're actually creating here is now starting to rise to the top. The fact that we have the SDGs, the fact that, you know, a nice little colorful placard that we can look at and we can start conceptualizing what is a complex challenge on how do we measure the impact and how do we ensure that Indigenous support is part of that conversation. Um, we've got about... Uh, 40, about 15 minutes left. Um, I'll throw in a, a couple of questions that are put in here just for another round on whoever wants to kind of speak to anything that we've spoken to so far uh, and continue on these. Uh, so one of them is from Eugenia, who asks, um, uh, wondering where one can begin looking for information or reading to get information on Indigenous startups, any projects that have been successful in this space. Um, I know that speaks to some of the work that I attempt to do around the, the mapping. Um, and uh, you know how do we how do we understand a little bit more? Um, so if we want to have a conversation there, um, and another one I'll throw in there: capital raising seems to be one of the largest hurdles that Indigenous businesses face. Is there a differentiation between the barriers for Indigenous versus non-Indigenous? And there's no differentiation. How do we how do their proposed approaches better suit Aboriginal needs? And I'll just put a bit of perspective on that one on the chat of having with both Lauren and, and Les, is that. Um, you know, you think about people who um, might already have access and a lot of the innovation hubs, I know when I ran my innovation hub in Ipswich, I said, look, we're, um, we're inclusive. Anyone can walk through the door. And then just that awareness I had at about 18 months in realizing that some people just won't walk through the door. Yes, we're inclusive, but just because of the very nature of how it's structured, we won't. Um, and so the additional conversations or costs or representation that needs to happen in order for them to actually engage with what we conceptualize as the ecosystem is significant. You can actually put a dollar value and a cost and effort to that. 
for what that tradition is. So I might throw both of those out to the panels. Um, one, how do we know about indigenous entrepreneurship? Who is doing some of the, the work currently? I know I've been doing some mapping work as well, but what else do we have at the individual level? And what is that gap? Like, how do we how do we quantify that and really address maybe some people that might say, but we're already inclusive and they already have access, which by representation, we think, well, but something's, something doesn't seem about right. How do we have that conversation? Jumping over, so for the first question, broke it down into a few different areas, and it's um, obviously the, the awesome work you're doing around mapping with Kieran um, Shad, uh, certainly an area to, uh, to look into uh, for Eugene, I think it was, uh, but some of the other entities out there, in I guess a plug for Lean, but in Digitech, uh, even their website, the, the content on there, they do a lot of awesome work um, across, obviously in New South Wales, but across, across the country. You've got different hubs, Yapa Hub in, you know, in Sydney, Guru Hub over here, like getting amongst other Indigenous businesses. Uh, then you've got programs. So underneath the programs, you know, you had Nagami at um, RMIT, Trade Roots at RMIT, uh, but also Melbourne Business School run the Mara program. And it's uh, an, an amazing uh, program. But you also have research as well. The research papers out there, some really good research papers, the KPMG Igniting the Indigenous Economy Report, and it talks and highlights around startups. And a lot of those questions that just me asked now. Um, then in addition to Backing Black Business, uh, another report uh, we released a few months back, but it, it, that really highlights I think, was some of those questions around barriers to um, yeah, accessing investment, some of the challenges. And, and a lot of it is, you know, there's a lot of businesses that are challenged or can be a factor from low income housing networks as well. Um, further social exclusion as well, geographic location. There's a, a myriad of reasons, but with this digital economy, particularly for tech based startups, that access is becoming easier. I think that's where you know the exciting thing being on this panel that it's starting to collaborate with uh, create this network and connection of. Um, indigenous entrepreneurs and indigenous investors and in particular with the uh, and I guess going back to the that question around venture capital like what is an indigenous startup and that challenge though about the uh, once you start to dilute uh, like Lauren was saying is venture capital the right thing uh, but raising investment and you obviously naturally you're going to dilute your equity stake and then become less than 50 percent but how do you do that some of those gaps that have been plugged across the country we have seen successful indigenous business owners and the exciting thing now like where is that gap and how do we become investors ourselves and uh start might have their it's their first believers program uh actually have explorer um and obviously we've just recently uh, launched the dream venture master classes but this is this will create a pathway for agile business owners professionals leaders to become uh investors to become a, a pathway to become a sophisticated investor under the legislation. So without the $2.5 million in assets or 250K a year in salary, but it's creating this pathway for the first time where Aboriginal people can become investors themselves. So if they want to park one to 5% of whatever of their network into another Indigenous in, or into an Indigenous side, this is the first time it can happen. So what, we, what we've seen un, unintentionally is that those Indigenous angel investors now pulling together, you know, let's create the black angels and let's take this like so let's create this at scale and then invest in our our startups and and i guess excitingly seeing these now angel indigenous angel investors being at the table with non-indigenous indigenous investors and the i guess the the education translation between both so both parties learning from each other so those non-indigenous vcs very successful venture capitalists and, and angel investors learning about yeah, the challenges about Indigenous businesses. We are more socially um, focused. Well, our Indigenous startups have more of a social impact focus, so ROI could take a little bit longer, but it's that navigation between both worlds. So you've got these Indigenous business owners learning from VCs and vice versa. And that's the exciting part of what we're starting to see, this transition where much like Harlem Capital in the US, it started off with a small uh, angel investing firm, now they've had some really big, large corporate backers. And this is what we want to see in Australia where, you know, creating all of us here, this first of its kind Indigenous entrepreneurs, but on the opposite side, reducing those barriers of entry for Indigenous startups to raise capital as well. I wanted to jump in um, quickly there as well, if there's a, a chance that I can. Um, 
so I just yeah really wanted to um one one of the resources as well actually is on the worthwhile ventures site which is um in um, investment ready white paper um that was um, pulled together by um the board and um a series of supporters um mainly with a focus from Ann Jackson the um the founder of the organization co-founder with Gavin um I, I think one of the key things and Les raised this as, uh, as a point from Lauren as well is around um are you even looking to actually um receive investment and if so what is the journey of thought that you've actually gone into in regards to actually how um what that looks like for you but then when you go to look for an investor don't just it, it's not something where you go talk to an investor and then overnight you make a decision and then there's a whole bunch of money in your your bank account and then you know you set and forget it's a it's a journey there's a journey of learning it's about you learning about the process it's about the investors learning about your business it's about um understanding this this ecosystem so there's there's a period of time that it takes to actually go th go through this journey and that's essentially you know why these conversations are taking place at the moment and why this this space is growing but the important thing here is about understanding are you being diluted what does what does dilution mean like what does it mean now but what does it also mean if you're going for multiple rounds of investment over the next several years like how does that actually affect um you know your position within and your stake within the business so there's a lot of complexities and a lot of different elements to actually think about. And then when you when you go out and you look for an investor, um, don't look for an investor just as someone who's going to be giving you money. Look at an investor as an ally. And we talked about this before using this language in this conversation around uh, investors as allies and how they then um, help you uh, get an understanding of the ecosystem firstly, but looking at what value means in your business as well. And you educating them on what value means from your perspective too, as an indigenous business owner and an entrepreneur. And so the idea here is about then going and saying, all right, well, how do I use this person, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, in a favorable way um, with reciprocity to learn about what they see value in. And then you might walk away, and this goes to a point I made earlier from uh, a potential investor who's like, look, I, like, I don't want to, I don't think that you're ready for us. We're not ready to invest in you. But what you do is you go like, okay, can you tell me what the things are? That you might look at to actually for us to be investor ready and can i actually come back to you and learn from you about how um some of these boxes that i'm ticking um that i'm able to actually do that and sometimes you might pick up multiple elements from multiple different investors so if you get kicked out of the door from one investor go and talk to multiple other investors build your network start to connect with them start to learn what they're doing and also teach them about our values and what we're trying to achieve as well so that's that shared journey that that we should be you know generally going on Thanks for that, Liam. Um, we got about six minutes left, uh, and Lauren and, and Gavin, um, Lauren, I appreciate sure you've got heaps of insights as far as the shared journey, as far as what that means for Startmate and, and that support. So just any last thoughts from the two of you? Yeah, I, I guess I just wanted to quickly pick up on the things that Liam is saying and also some of the comments that Gavin made before. I think we are entering a different phase of of investing and, and like the venture capital ecosystem in terms of truly understanding and having more of an embedded appreciation for what value looks like beyond just the kind of financial return. There is a perception of venture capital and a lot of that can be true and there certainly is a financial return that is the clearest indicator of success from an investment perspective. But uh, I think that more and more these days, investors are looking for the impact that a business can have and the, tr the trickle down effect of that impact is where the financial return comes into play. I just wanted to quickly mention one of the companies that was part of the most recent cohort. I mentioned we haven't had a First Nations founder, but we did have an incredible Maori powerhouse woman named Candice, whose business job loads um, is a really incredible example of, you know, what a good start make company could be, what a potentially investable um, company that's that's been founded with an indigenous uh, lens on on value, um, the the job loads platform essentially is trying to match uh, contingent workers who are ultimately uh, picking fruit and and working on the orchards who currently have kind of an undocumented and unstructured and um, quite a precarious work position. So the whole philosophy of of job loads is to restore the mana for the people who are doing that work, which is the, the honor in in employment and and having some sort of job security, that is 100% the value and the intention behind that business. But of course, to do that at scale is an incredibly valuable thing, which is where the venture capital or the investment kind of framework comes in. And then to be able to, um, 
to scale that to to actually create and provide value to so many people ultimately has some kind of you know investment benefit as well just to just to kind of illustrate where these things can end up being aligned and it's not every case but I thought that was an interesting one to share um, for people on the call as well thanks for that Lauren and Gavin what, yeah. last last words to wrap last, up couple last words. yeah look um so with my other role I guess I'm a senior Aboriginal voice in New South Wales for our social services sector. Um, and just touching on the unfortunate um, social um, vulnerability and disadvantage um, broadly across our community and, and hearing, um, you know, our conversation today about um, social impact. Um, it is on our mind. We live and breathe it 24-7. We're, we're thinking creatively and I can see this occurring and emerging that we will use enterprise as our next intervention to help our mob, our communities um, find a new way forward. Um, it's um, that, that reoccurring theme. Yes, what we do achieve as an entrepreneur in a for-profit way, um, there's no doubt we will look at um, the return of, of, of um, gain, uh, benefit back to community. But I'll just put this challenge out to everyone. Our community in, a, in the social setting at the moment, in many ways, is quite paralyzing our young ones and, and our communities. Um, our communities are even yearning for community enterprise. They are really struggling to establish startup for, uh, for purpose community enterprises. Um, I just wonder if we can turn this totally on its head and, and, and look look for ways in which we can enable um, our communities to, to establish such strength in um, enterprise, community enterprise, you know, um, social enterprise, for profit enterprise, and really flip this. Um, and yes, the points have been made. It's a longer journey. Uh, and look, we would really welcome more conversations with those investors and, and relationships that want to come on a longer journey. Um, we need you. Uh, and we, we would look to that uh, shared journey Liam's talking about, yeah. Excellent, thanks for that, Gavin. Um, it, it's been an amazing panel. I'm very much honored to, to just be able to be in the room with you guys as, you, as we all talk about where to from here and where we've come up to. That. Just thank you for the opportunity. Um, hopefully our attendees got something out of it. Uh, there's been a lot of questions coming through, a lot of conversation on the, on the chat, which has been good engagement. I really appreciate that. Um, I might just, just wrap up and, and Gavin, you know, you mentioned turning on its head um, and an hour is not enough time to come up with a solution. But, um, you know, I often refer to that we can, we can play the game, we can change the rules or we can change the game. And the question I have is what is the game changer? Because if we play the game, it's gonna be on its current, you know, normal expansion trajectory. We can change the rules a bit and have some, some different programs and things. And that's, that's interesting and good value. Well, what are the game changers? And that's things that we haven't thought of. And maybe um, we won't. Maybe it's the entrepreneurs that we deal with. Maybe it's it's something that just comes up through the work that we do within Startmate, within the, the investor program that, that Les is turning up within Worthwhile Ventures. Um, but this is a start of a conversation to inspire some of that. Um, we are seeing it as a movement, as we're starting to see, as Lauren says, people are looking to say, well, what is the value of my investment beyond just profit? Um, and what is the total impact? And how do we support, um, you know, what is collectively the commons of, of society uh, to get, you know, industry and, and government and corporates, everybody involved in order to say, how do we address this better moving forward? Um, so I do very much thank you uh, for all your contributions and your wisdom that you've shared today. I'm looking forward to further conversations as we advance, um, both from this as well as other people who might see this on recording. Um, so thank you very much. We'll, we'll stop the official one. Um, we can kind of have a bit of a yarn after if you want to kind of do a bit of a recap as people go off the attendees list. Um, but um, just officially ending this now and saying thank you very much. Thanks for organizing, Chad. Yeah, thanks for thank organizing, Chad. And everyone on the panel yeah. as well. As well. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Yes, appreciate it. <laughs> um, yeah, as, so as a follow-up, guys, um, I'm happy to, to send out an email to participants, do a bit of a blog post saying here's the recording. Uh, if you